My name is Eric Elliott. I'm the archivist here at the Moravian Archives in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I want to welcome you to another year of lunchtime lectures. Although right now it's not lunchtime, I'm sitting on our back porch, which is actually the third floor porch on the east side of our building here in Winston-Salem. It's a beautiful view. I wish I came out here more often, and I wanted to invite you out here to have a moment of reverie before we begin our talk today to talk about where we are this year in 2020. Um, I'm going to give you some exciting news today about a conference that we've had planned for some time that we've had to change completely in six months, and we're still working on some kinks on the fly on how to turn a live conference into an online experience for you to sit home and enjoy. I want to thank you for your individual forbearance and your collective patience and continuing support during this uh, unusual season in all of our lives. Uh, I'm amazed at the fidelity of uh, the financial supporters of this place and the new support that we've gotten as folks realize that uh, finances have hit all of our non-essential institutions and um, your uh, participation today in, in viewing this um, is part of that support. We thank you for that. But I uh, want to tell you that our plan is to continue to be open to available for you if you have any kind of inquiry about our records and um, many of you continue to ask about your family histories or about church questions and we love it. Please sign up and follow us on our Facebook page. Well, we will have an exciting set of speakers to come to you probably by video like this during the first part of the year, hopefully with live speakers again in the spring. Uh, but we'll be announcing that as we go along on our webpage, our Facebook, and by email. If you haven't uh, defined up to join our email mailing list, um, you can uh, do so, and I'll give you information for that at the end of today's video. Uh, I want to stop right now and tell you, while we're going to put a screen over this beautiful view out here, look overlooking God's Acre, um, uh, this is how you register for the conference Becoming American. Go to this website and sign on. We've made it a one-stop shop this week. We've got lots of information. You know, academics are, are great at giving you lots of details. And you had to weave through a lot of details to sign up for multiple events because back in the spring, there were multiple discrete physical places you had to go to. Now, with an online conference, it's a one-stop shop. You register and you'll get access codes to all the different events. We hope you can attend as many of them as you can, the different public uh, information events, the public keynote lectures. Um, and uh, this conference is designed a little different from some conferences that some of you are familiar with in the Moravian community, unlike the Bethlehem Conference on uh, Moravian Music and History that happens every couple of years. Uh, this uh, Renova conference format is designed to have a private component uh, just for scholars to consult with international experts and working on papers and research. That's in the morning of the uh, three and a half days of our conference. That's not open to the public, but as a result of those private conversations, there'll be papers that will be turned into hopefully a book product that you can uh, uh, purchase and support in the next year or so. And we'll be giving you more information about that. But then what's interesting about the Renolda Conference format, rather than just supporting academic research, it wants to invite a town and gown kind of conversation. And so today we're gonna to be talking about the different ways that you can plug into that conversation to hear experts who've been brought in uh, thanks to this uh, conference to share their research about different aspects of the interactions in the Moravian community with different communities and neighbors around it. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. But I want to just come back to the porch and say, um, uh, as a Southern boy, you know it's all nice to sit out on the front porch. Now, this is uh, outside of our air conditioning. The breeze this morning is wonderful. And uh, reminded in the stresses of this day how nice it is uh, to come out and breathe in the good air the Lord provided us and to uh, remember and pause and give thanks for each other. It's through each other that we'll get through this. Uh, the Lord gave us each other for support. And we're grateful for your continuing support as we plan ahead to our programs in this 2020 pandemic year. So let's talk about this conference. So on September 23rd through the 26th, there's going to be an online uh, academic town and ground interdisciplinary conference called Becoming American. 
about Moravians and their neighbors from 1772 to 1822. And I want to give you today an overview of what's going to happen in this event. Uh, you can go, I'll just tell you right now, if all the details get numbing and you just say, let me learn more about what's going on as it happens, all you have to do today is simply go to one-stop registration uh, to the event. There's an address at the bottom of the screen here, Humanities Institute, Wake Forest University, EDU, Programming BA Registration. That's long. We haven't put uh, together a uh, shorthand um, symbol for it. So if you type in simply search Becoming American Wake Forest University or Becoming American WFU, you'll see pop up on the screen to the left on the opening page a descriptive paragraph about this conference. And at the bottom of that descriptive uh, paragraph, you see the words click here to register. When you click to register, you get the middle screen, which is a simple registration form. And then when you fill that form out, you'll get a paragraph that tells you, hey, when it gets time to the conference, um, we'll send you a, a link with um, a pay, an email with links to all the Zooms connections where you can watch the different aspects of this conference online. Now, this conference is being co-convened by three individuals. Uh, Ulrika Wiethaus, who's the professor the Department of the for the Study of uh, Religions and Academic Ethnic Studies program at Wake Forest University. Grant McAllister, who's the Associate Professor and Leveson Faculty Fellow uh, at the Department of German and Russian at Wake Forest University. Yours truly, who I'm the archivist here at Moravian Archives. And you can see down the bottom left, uh, we've been uh, uh, gathering masks and, and uh, social distance like everybody else for some time now planning this conference. And I want to tell you that this conference comes from um, uh, a long conversation of what ifs about the cooperation that we could do in this uh, area for those who are interested in Moravian studies. In fact, the three of us, uh, Professor Veithaus, uh, Callister, and myself got together and uh, invited some folks in November of 2018, representatives from local colleges, universities, and the Moravian record keepers around here, Old Salem, Mesda, and ourselves. And we formed a new Moravian Studies Collaborative. And we've been meeting almost monthly since that time, except maybe during the summertime. We started out up here at Foothills Brewing with just some informal sharing of uh, ideas. Um, we, we, we formed pretty early on working groups, uh, three things in the spring of 2019. We uh, I uh, worked with uh, Professor Veithaus as she was looking to do um, uh, documentation with her class for making Winston-Salem a Trail of Tears witness community. Um, uh, uh, Professor McAllister took the lead on getting together some grant applications uh, through Wake Forest University to perhaps form a conference like this. The Renolda conference format was there. It's something that we thought was attractive and we'll tell you more about in a minute. And then uh, I took the lead on trying to to get together regular gatherings where we could just share information about what research is doing. Those started in person. You see this gathering at, at Mayberry's in the middle. And of late, because of the pandemic, our, our numbers in the conference uh, conversations, uh, collaborative conversations have actually increased because we're now able to bring in uh, people from outside the state. Uh, we've had uh, international folks sign in. And it's been really uh, kind of an interesting thing that this uh, collaborative has actually expanded while our uh, ability to physically connect has, has contracted in the last few months. But as a result of this conversation and the support of uh, the Humanities Institute at Wake Forest University, Wake Forest University and the Moravian Archives are sponsoring this conference at the end of the month. We're not alone, we have a whole parcel of supporters. The main financial support for this conference comes from the Andrew Mellon Foundation. Um, uh, which has given the grant to, to the Humanities Institute. A number of uh, departments at the Wake Forest University have been involved in the support of uh, our work, uh, including the Office of the Provost, who is misspelled on this slide, but we'll fix him up on the backside. And um, we are, are grateful for all the, the many hours of work and support that different groups have put in uh, to make this conference happen. Originally, it was going to be scattered in locations all across town at Salem College, which is Salem State, uh, the Milton Rhodes Fine Arts Center, Innovation Quarter down at, at Wake Forest. Now it's all an online event. What's the event about? You know, the Moravian movement uh, is uh, in and of itself a fascinating story, uh, beginning in Europe, 
uh, vision of uh, Count Zinzendorf to take the gospel uh, to all nations and especially to the unchurched um, with a focus on native peoples and the enslaved. Uh, Zeisberger's work as a missionary in the frontier and support of families like the Nishmans. They, they were interested in gathering together as many different peoples uh, to take the word of salvation to them. And you see uh, Haight's picture of the ideal of first fruits from all different lands and all different peoples coming from where they were, where their different cultures uh, to the Lord. And uh, they gathered together quite intentionally, this small group of folks, men and women in the Moravian community to, to send land arbiter, to send missionaries uh, to folks in all these far-flung locations, including in 1753, sending them down from Pennsylvania to the frontiers of North Carolina uh, to form places like Bethabra, Bethania, and in 1766, Salem. Here's a view of Salem from the Southwest in 1787. So why have we called this conference Becoming American? Well, the year 1772 to 1822 our 50 years of Moravian influence changed in this area. In this time, there was a dynamic exchange of cultural, religious, and social practice between Moravians and their neighbors, which included indigenous people, the Africans that they had alongside them, the European uh, settlers. Uh, it engendered a new national character peculiar to Wachovia. And so with the next few days in this conference, what we're gonna do is talk about uh, through research papers, public education presentation, and keynote lectures and the culture performance. We're gonna look at the different ways in which this exchange took place, uh, an exchange that would in fact come to define a particular Moravian American character here in North Carolina. There's a special focus in the presentations, uh, private and public in this conference on four themes, uh, the African American and Native American relationships with Moravians, uh, arts, artisans, and architecture, religion, gender, and economics, and new findings from the Moravian archival holdings. Uh, uh, there's a lot of details when you go to the website. You see all the performers and you see all the different things. And I wanted to break this down kind of uh, thematically for a second and to tell you that the conference is put together with three different kinds of components. In the mornings on Thursday and Friday and continuing Saturday in a different way, it's, it's a focus on research. The Renota Conference format wants to emphasize the creation of new academic research on a given topic, but also wants to invite the public to learn about that research and to engage in the topics that are of interest to the researchers. And so in the mornings, we're having these private meetings on on Thursdays and Fridays with academic presentations by different scholars and discussions among the scholars. There'll be a public review of that academic work with the closing keynote address on Saturday at lunchtime. Uh, in the afternoons, there's an opportunity for folks in the public to, to get some education about different aspects of these relationships between Moravians and their neighbors. So there'll be a focus on Cherokees, on Moravians, on African Americans, and how art uh, because it's a Renolda conference, it's uh, one of the things about it is that it involves the, the uh, Renolda uh, uh, House Museum of uh, Modern American Art, or of American Art, and uh, what we want to do is to, to focus on that as well. Nighttime, think of it in terms of thematic events about our neighbors. Uh, the opening culture performance will, will be specifically tasked to, uh, to that about how Moravians interacted with their neighbors. There's gonna also be a panel discussion and a keynote lecture in the evening. So mornings is a research component, afternoons, public education, nights is sort of thematic uh, about the topic, neighbors. So let's go through the days if we can, uh, just to kind of show you the different things. On Wednesday, we've got two things in the afternoon. Uh, an hour or so opening welcome and from information. And then in the evening at seven o'clock, uh, we've got the culture performance. Now the opening welcomes will be some words that we've recorded here in uh, the RTK Davis Center in our reading room. There'll be a informative video uh, that shows how the Moravians came to North Carolina and the transition really from those early years of passage at Thabra to, to starting the community here in Salem. Um, and 
from wealth of them then, that also um, I would say that uh, one of the interesting things that I think is important if you can tune in is to hear uh, Grant's talk about what it means to be a neighbor. And that word neighbor has a special connotation in the German language and the Moravian understanding of uh, Nachbar, uh, which I think will be of interest to you. Um, the Cultural Performance Night on Wednesday is uh, uh, an artistic attempt to, to tell the interwoven stories in the Moravians with their neighbors. You know, but we have in our records the tale about the uh, Cherokee being fed during this, the um, Seven Years' War, French and Indian War in the 1750s. They would come by uh, to, and, and the Moravians would feed them as they went north to go battle the Shawnee uh, who were aligning with, aligning with the French. And what's interesting is you, you go from this early uh, interaction with the Cherokee that's based on trade and, and common interest and then as that war turns and the Cherokee turn against uh, the European settlers uh, in North Carolina, there's a, there's a tension between it. Once that tension disappears, later on, the Moravians are able to do missionary work in, uh, among the Cherokee in uh, the Spring Place Mission um, in what would become uh, Georgia, but was Cherokee territory then. And um, we've got that relationship uh, contrasted with the African Americans who are always an integral part of Wachovia. Uh, they lived alongside the European Moravians. They were artisans, craftspeople. Um, uh, the, they were uh, free and enslaved. And the, um, eventually some of them became worshipers alongside uh, the Moravians in their congregations. And then there was a separate congregation uh, formed uh, it's one of the oldest black congregations in the United States, St. Philip's. And so this evening's performance will artistically tell you the story of those interactions between the three different communities. It's a performance put together by Andre Minkins, who's a professor, associate professor of uh, uh, theater and drama at uh, Winston-Salem State. Um, he's put together a, a, a team of folks to, to work with him, Dylan Morgan. He's, uh, artists in the Eastern Band of Cherokee, Laura Similian, who's a talented vocalist, uh, uh, Matthew Tune, who's a Cherokee storyteller, spoken word artist. There'll be music there provided by the Moravian Music Foundation and um, interactive work with uh, different theater students at Wake and Winston-Salem State. So I'm looking forward to seeing that performance. Um, you know, the uh, this 50 years is a long time. Uh, just look at this difference in the rates of travel between 1800 and 1830, how time was cut in half to get from place to place simply by better modes of transportation, better roads. Uh, what started out as a community on the hinterland at the beginning, uh, 1772, is well connected to uh, growing America by 1822. So we've also got to look at changes in the Redmond community in terms of how the greater world's in, impacting it, the, the bigger neighbor. And and um, here you have some pictures of uh, the original uh, Gemeinde House in Salem, which was uh, replaced in 1800 by the uh, home church. And uh, here at the upper right is an illustration of um, the Cherokee mission at Spring Place and the drawing here at the bottom of Bethania. And, and all these communities are, are growing at the same time and interacting in different ways with the neighbors around it. On Thursday, what we want to do is uh, start the, what's called uh, for the public component, uh, Walk and Learn, uh, uh, which is, it literally was at the beginning thinking of this conference when it was going to be a live thing in April. It was going to actually be a series of tours where people would gather around at either uh, Mesta or Old Salem uh, at our place, and we were going to have uh, things that you could physically see and do. Now those uh, walk and learn events are going to be virtual. Uh, there'll be a video component where uh, a lead uh, um, educator will, will walk you through some artifacts, some locations, and, uh, and then at the end of that hour, there'll be a question and answer session where you can uh, join in and ask uh, live questions of that person who's, who's gonna be your guide. And then the evening on Thursday, we're gonna have a panel discussion about the Cherokee. So let me give you a, uh, a few more details about what's gonna happen on, on this particular day. 
Um, in the afternoon, um, we have two walk and learn components uh, from two to four. First is by Sally Gant, who uh, for 30 years ran the uh, uh, Mesa Summer Institute program. She's an outstanding expert in the collections of Mesa, and she's going to guide us in sort of a behind the scenes tour of the Mesa collections as they uh, pertain to uh, the, the Native American, American Indian experience, um, Cherokee basketry, paintings of important Cherokee uh, leaders, um, uh, different crafts that are reflecting of the world of the Cherokee, Catawba, and other Native American peoples. And that'll be a fascinating uh, uh, hour uh, together with Sally. And, and then an, a, a, a wonderful thing that uh, originally was gonna be held in our uh, Moravian archives is an exhibit of uh, uh, artifacts gathered by Moravian missionaries. And Andrew Gustell, who's the uh, director of the Museum of Anthropology out at White Forest University, um, is kind of inverted the, the topic of our uh, conference from becoming American to becoming Moravian. And it uh, sort of gives the flip uh, uh, side experience to the artifact of, of what it meant to, uh, to have the, uh, a native experience be transformed by in the process of becoming um, Moravian. And uh, missionaries collected all these different examples of cultural objects to show their supporters uh, evidence of the diverse communities in which they work. And so, what he's going to walk through with their collection and interpret it as to uh, uh, the different impact of Moravian missionaries around the world. Our panel discussion that evening is a um, reflection among three experts uh, in Cherokee culture about what the experience of the interaction between Cherokee and uh, the European neighbors like the Moravians um, meant to Cherokee culture. Um, 17th century was a period of rapid change for all indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the social structures, uh, the decentralized government, all their cultural values um, were different and, and antithetical in many ways to Western culture. And so we've got three experts who are going to talk about that. Tom Belt, who's an Oklahoma Cherokee who uh, works at Western Carolina University, University teaching uh, the Cherokee language, uh, T.J. Holland, who was a cultural resources supervisor for the Eastern Band of Cherokee and director of their General Oska Memorial, um, and then uh, Christine Al, who's doing some own work, uh, own work on um, history of the Cherokee newspaper, the Cherokee Phoenix. Um, she's also a member of the Eastern Band of Cherokee, and we're looking forward to hearing them share what it meant to have these interactions from the Cherokee. Uh, worldview, as opposed to what we read about it in the records of the Moravians in North Carolina from the uh, Moravian worldview. So we've got lots of records at our place, uh, a, a wonderful list. I would love to have one day a, a poster with all the signatures of Moravians we have. This is a good start from May 18, uh, 1770 of um, uh, the Brothers Agreement, uh, the men only at this time was signing, and you see a lot of names in local Moravian history right here on that one page. And then on the right, you see a listing of, of those who purchased land in Wachovia in 1795 outside of uh, the poor settlements, and, and you see they're clustered together in the regions that are served by the church. But um, we have the amazing documentation of how the land became went from frontier to um, settled uh, uh, over the 110 years of uh, church administration, church records that we have up to 1863 with our last map of what's who owns what. Lots of uh, information about the changing roles of gender in our records. Um, uh, the start of the um, female boarding school it would become um, Salem Academy and college. Uh, we've got records of that, outreach records from the Female Missionary Society that started uh, congregations like uh, St. Philip's um, got their records here too as well. Friday, we've got for you uh, two other Walk and Learn events in the afternoon, and then a special keynote lecture about the um, interaction of Moravians with African uh, peoples. And so I uh, wanted to tell you a little bit more about the details of those um, 
events. On Friday afternoon at 2, Martha Hartley is going to give new insights into the Hidden Town project. If you're to the area, I'm sure you've heard about Hidden Town. It's, a, it's an attempt to, um, uh, to put into the interpreted landscape of Old Salem the story of um, enslaved uh, people who lived alongside the uh, uh, European Moravians here in uh, the area. And it um, is using uh, archaeological research, uh, trying to look at a, the physical records uh, of, uh, of um, whether it's census records or records in our place, to, to try to build up stories, to share uh, for the visitor experience, um, uh, what it meant to be living in Salem back in the days that have been historically associated with Old Salem um, in its interpretation. Um, so looking forward to hearing from Martha more about that. At uh, four, at uh, three o'clock on uh, Friday, there'll be a special walk and learn uh, with Allison Slaby, who's curator at uh, Renolda House Museum of American Art. And just to go over for, from their perspective, what is American about American art? And although this uh, talk won't particularly be related to Moravians, I think uh, it will probably inform your future viewing of uh, uh, some Moravian artwork and uh, give you a better sense of perspectives on how to look at uh, our environment around us critically as art often does. I had the privilege of hearing uh, Reverend Dr. Winnell Kirtan Roberts at the Sixth Moravian Conference for uh, Sixth Conference on Moravian uh, History and Music in Bethlehem in 2018, and and she's a compelling speaker. She's a, a longtime pastor at Memorial Moravian Church um, and St. Thomas uh, in the Virgin Islands. Um, she's the last year been studying in Geneva, Switzerland. She's going to talk about the theme of her particular research on black people and a white God, Moravianism and cultural purification in her area, the Afro-Caribbean and Antigua and T Tobago, and, and uh, just the numbers of people who were forcefully shipped to the British owned colonies between 1662 and 1807, 3.1 million. And for many years, um, they practiced uh, African religions alongside Christianity, and it was really the Moravians who were the first missionaries uh, to believe that the African soul was worthy of conversion. And as she talks about uh, their work in the Caribbean and um, how uh, that changed the um, understanding of uh, divinity uh, uh, for those uh, enslaved persons living there, and uh, how that related to um, changing and letting go of the African components of their understanding of divinity. Um, so be interested to hear her perspective on that because that's a similar experience for those Africans who ended up coming and living uh, among the Moravians here as well. Uh, so glad to have her join us for this conference. On Saturday morning, we're going to have a panel discussion, which uh, will finally give you a peek into what's been going on during this conference from the academics. Um, and, and we're very blessed to have, uh, leading that, uh, I noted, uh, well, we've got two great scholars on Saturday morning. I'll just tell you about that in a second. And then um, uh, the second scholar is uh, going to give us a closing keynote lecture about the Moravian um, experience of capturing stories and what um, the Moravian interpreted story means. Um, here, you got, we've done so much work the last few years on uh, uh, trying to find out the, the records of stories of people who have been left out. Uh, uh, I think of the, uh, the wonderful work that was done in the uh, 1990s and 2000s on trying to, to find the names of those persons who were in the the graveyard, unmarked graves in front of uh, St. Philip's Church building on uh, Church Street. And then in the last couple of years, there's been an extra effort trying to figure out the names of those who were in the second graveyard up at the corner of uh, Salem Avenue. And uh, we, we are lucky to have the, on the right a, a better listing of those 
um, persons who were buried there. And yet still, it was an incomplete, uh, I think we had records of just under 200 burials and there's over 300 persons buried there. So still lots of work to, to, to uh, properly document stories of all those impacted in the greater Moravian community. And yet what we're looking here at the end of this conference is what can we say changed between 1772 and 1822. And you see this view of Salem looks a lot different uh, from what it did just 50 years earlier. It's much more, how well, I guess would say gentrified and uh, a true uh, organized space in the wilderness uh, of, of breakwater. And um, so what we're gonna do in the Saturday morning session is we're blessed to have uh, John Sensbach who who really started the examination in a uh, very public way about the different experience of um, neighbors among the Moravian community by looking at a separate Canaan, uh, his text uh, about the uh, Afro-American or Afro-Moravian culture as he describes it here in um, North Carolina. Um, at about the same time period that our conference is looking at. He went on and continued to, to look at the uh, Moravian um, African connection in the Caribbean through um, Rebecca's revival. And really that story is uh, not just Caribbean, it goes, she goes back to Africa and to Europe as well. So it's fascinating transatlantic um, expression of what it means to be Moravian. You see John here in a the uh, Bethlehem Conference a couple of years back, John's there on the left leading a discussion. We, will, we were hopeful to have him uh, do that live, but now it will be a virtual conversation. And what we're gonna do to make that conversation possible on Saturday morning is, is have representatives um, from each of the four working groups in this conference um, share about um, their themes uh, with John and talk about what has been learned in the course of the conference. And I want to share with you now right quickly the names of the, and topics of what will be presented at the conference. So David Bergstone, um, Salem Congregation will be talking about Moravian architecture becoming Southern. David Bloom of the uh, Moravian uh, Music Foundation is gonna be talking about the Americanization of Moravian music. Stuart Carter out at uh, uh, Bake Forest is gonna be talking about performances of Joseph Hayden's, uh, Hayden's creation in the American South, uh, the Moravian connection to that. Jeff Hughes has been doing uh, doctoral research at Old Salem. We're gonna be talking about Salem Congregation's own pottery on um, Lot 38, where he's been doing archeological work. Um, topics on religion, gender, and economics. Craig Atwood up in Moravian College is gonna be talking about uh, Zinzendorf, Spangenberg, and Moravian's American. You know, Craig is, um, uh, our leading Moravian theological historian. He, he knows uh, that area better than anyway. We're glad to have him with us. Grant McAllister, one of our co-presenters here, um, co-conveners is gonna be talking about the shifting ways that Easter Sunday uh, happened in Salem. Jake Rudderman, who's a professor at uh, Wake Forest University is gonna be talking about Tronga Baggy and Salem's Brethren in Revolutionary America, what it was like to negotiate as the Moravians in their neutrality um, worked with uh, pro and anti-British uh, uh, neighbors in the area. Larry Tyers, who's a professor at East Carolina University, uh, is gonna be talking in a similar vein about loyalty tests and unruly guest. Riddick Weber, who's also at Moravian College and a, a friend of uh, local congregations here, um, is gonna be talking about the changing role of the single sisters choir in Salem during this time period. Um, Hull, a uh, set of talks about Moravian, African-American, and American Indian relationships. Martha Hartman is going to be talking about the changing landscape of slavery in Salem. Raina McClinton, who who's two volume Spring Place Diaries in the uh, 2000s was a um, um, opening of our records about the missionary uh, diaries uh, to the Cherokee and, and um, an inspirational work for many. Um, She's gonna talk about Moravian missions to the American and Indian communities in North America. Andre Minkins is gonna go over uh, his um, thinking behind intertwining the story of um, Wachovia and his cultural performance on, from Wednesday night. Charles Rodenbaugh who's an independent um, scholar from uh, Guilford County, has been working for years on trying to understand the relationship between the, the folks in, in 
what's now Rockingham County, what would be the uh, Lower Sour Settlement, uh, and looking at the relationship of those who came from Antigua uh, as enslaved to Sourtown Plantation and their relationship to Moravians in Antigua and Salem. And finally, our um, co-convener, Oweka Vithaus, is going to be talking about Moravian missionary spirituality um, and how that changes in three different cultural contexts. Lastly, I'll be leading a group of my fellow archivists from uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, to talk about some new insights, new works that we're, we're nurturing from our different places. I'm going to be talking about uh, the stories of enslaved persons and the records of our archives, how you can find them, about a database that we're working on to make that easier. Uh, Tom McCullough, who's the assistant archivist in Bethlehem, we're talking about Moravian memorialization and identity transformation in the early days of the Republic. And Paul Poiker, who's talked about uh, it's one thing to, to be an archivist, it's another thing to realize that your archives is often a selective record keeping and not a full record keeping. And he's going to talk about what it means uh, in the Moravian tradition, Moravian record keeping and archival selection. Fascinating topics. Hope you can hear, uh, stick with us and, and on that Saturday morning to hear about it. We close with a, uh, an expert in the Moravian special gift of memorialization in terms of a memoir. If you're not a Moravian, you may not know this uh, tradition that um, in the course of uh, your spiritual journey or uh, in the early days of the church, you were asked to write down your life story, your first person spiritual autobiography of what, what brought you in your life closer to your relationship to the Lord and uh, how your life was changed by that. And, and the Moravians document those life stories, have been documenting them since uh, the 18th century. And um, we have uh, over 14,000 of them in our collection. But what she looks at in the context of our conference is that when you look at the memoirs, which in the different ethnic groups that make up the Moravian communities, between colonial and Amer early American congregations, and you compare that with, with memoirs in the European tradition, uh, African descent and Native American congregation members, can you see patterns of, of recorded life experience the same or are there differences? And she's gonna look at how those documents um, might reveal differences in the self-professed motto of the Moravian Church um, of all things love, um, how the way we treat people may be reflected differently in those memoirs. Um, such a wonderful jam-packed three days plus that we're gonna have in just a couple of weeks. I hope that when we get together next, um, it will be online. Um, this is the end of uh, the talk for the day. This is the way the Moravian community was listed in 1835. And what's amazing to me then is that here on a map, 10 years after our period, so we're talking about almost 80 years after the Moravians moved here, even as they're integrated into the area, they still are marked as a separate geographical area on maps. And it's really not until the mid 1850s that that sort of disappears at the control of um, the church over the local institutions is separated. It becomes a fully civil uh, community, civilly governed community. Um, check out online, one stop registration, search again, Easiest way, type in Becoming American, WFU, go right to our page, uh, click on that link, and you will be able to sign up today uh, to be registered to participate in as much of this uh, public information as you possibly can. A whole lot of stuff, a whole lot of people have been working on this, and we'd love to share it with as many of you as you can. Um, it's going to be um, a great thing to get together and share about the special Moravian story and about its impacts on many um, who are with us and among us. And um, we're grateful for your attention today. And I don't know when we will physically meet again, but I can assure you we'll be sitting in the office working on things to keep us all entertained. And I'm hoping that that nice view out of the, the, uh, the Bilo house over on, there on Bank Street is not, too much longer in my future. I can get out and enjoy springtime, maybe with a little less COVID anxiety. So thanks for being with us today.